thank you very much. And uh, as chairperson, you know one of the obligations you have is to try and manage the time of, of the program. So because of that, we beg the presence of all of you to stand on the existing protocols and recognition that has been made and say a very good evening to all of you and especially to our August Honorable Guest Speaker, my own brother, IGP. Thank you very much and also to extend a very warm welcome to Nananum. Nananum, thank you so much for making time to come. Yamama Kwab. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, the need for everybody to respect the rule of law and champion peaceful coexistence cannot be emphasized enough. This is a responsibility we must all share. That is why I am deeply, deeply excited that we are blessed to have a very important son of the land, the IGP, Dr. George Akufu Dampare, to lead us to have this very relevant conversation on the changing face of policing in Ghana, expectations, and the role of the university community. My dear brother, thanks so very much for making time out of your very, very busy schedule to be with us. We really do appreciate this. I think he deserves some round of applause here. Thank you. We are very honored that you made time. Now allow me to refer to Herman Gosting Policing a Free Society, which instructively indicates to us that the quality of policing has a very direct effect on the quality of life in a democracy. The security of every society, as you will agree with me, is and should be a collective responsibility of all and sundry. It is critical that we see matters of security, obviously as a shared responsibility, and go all out, going through the model of all hands on deck to approach it and enhance it. For those of us who have been following the progress and the vision that this IGP and the Ghana Police Service are engineering to ensure that our security remains paramount in this country, we can attest to the fact that despite the challenges, indeed the, the challenges are numerous, the kind of innovation and partnership the IGP is bringing to the frontiers of policing in the country is great. And we must all contribute from every angle to make it work for all of us. IGP, your university, our university, the entire university community, obviously agrees that we have a huge role to play. And I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that by the time this lecture is over, we all will be very clear what we can all do to help ensure a safe, serene, and secured environment where we can all get on with our lives, with our studies, with everything that we are doing, our responsibilities, without any fear whatsoever. This public lecture, I believe, should reinvigorate in all of us new lead for research and advocacy that will strengthen the relationship between the Ghana Police Service, the academic community, intellectuals, 
universities, and our communities. This should be a synergistic relationship we must continue to nurture with deep passion. On this note, let me say that as I accept the responsibility to chair this function, KMUSD is committed to fostering close collaboration with the police service in terms of continual program development to build capacity in this area. I'd like to commend very highly the leadership of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences led by the provost, the dean, faculty of social sciences, head of department, and the leadership and team for working so very hard to give us this very exciting and educated program. Honorable guest speaker, our own IGP, Dr. Akufu Dampari, once again, on behalf of management and the entire university community, I say thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. For you, the audience, what I would say to you is that please relax and just take it all in as we listen to what our honorable speaker has for us this evening. I thank you all very much for your opportunity giving me to chair this function. Thank you. A louder round of applause for our chairperson. She's opening the way. And to help her perform her role, please help me to acknowledge these three distinguished personalities in our midst. The Research and Publications Committee of the Faculty of Social Sciences is chaired by Dr. Daniel Ousu Ansa. Thank you. Then the Public Lectures Committee chaired by Professor Atinuke Olusola Adebanji. Thank you. And then doing this in royalty is Nana Konedu Yadom, Asante Achim Ekutuase Adonten Hema. To introduce our speaker, shall we please welcome a lecturer in criminology here at KNUSC, Dr. Jones Upukuwari. Chairperson and the Vice Chancellor of KNUST, Professor Mrs. Rita Akusia Dixon, Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Alex Dabo, Provost of various colleges and Dean of the various faculties and schools, HODs, members of convocation, student leaders, media, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to introduce our guest speaker for today's Faculty of Social Science Public Lecture. The importance of this lecture, I must say, cannot be overemphasized because we are living in a time where crimes are evolving rapidly and we will need those leaders that will be able to develop policies and measures that will be able to fight the crimes that we are experiencing now. This realization, I surmise, may have influenced the decision of the appointing authority in the country in their choice of a leader to lead this charge. And now our speaker is a chartered accountant. He's also an adjunct lecturer and the current Inspector General of Police of Ghana. He's currently the youngest IGP appointed in the Fourth Republic and the eighth youngest since Ghana gained independence in 1957. In fact, I have a lot to say about him because he's also a friend and a brother. <laughs> but he says, I shouldn't say all those things, so I'll just simplify it. And now, there's one thing that many people don't know about him. Our guest speaker today also worked as a research fellow and a lecturer at the King's College 
University of London, and also lectured at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, Jimpa, Regent University College, and Data Link University College. But this might interest you. He is one of the pioneer lecturers at the business school of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. So today we have brought here our old very son. Madam Chairperson, this is the distinguished personality we are privileged to have in our midst today to deliver this public letter. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we all, with a standing ovation and a clap offering, invite to the podium the Inspector General of Ghana, Dr. George Akufu. Bye. Wow, I'm humble, extremely humble, but I'll do my best not to be emotional. Madam Chairperson, my sister, and the Vice Chancellor of this great university, of this great university, Professor Rita Akusia Dixon. Professor Akusia Dixon. Council, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Registrar of the University, our distinguished and accomplished members of faculty, our revered traditional and religious leaders. management and staff of this university, student leadership, fellow students, and at the appropriate time, I will explain why I say fellow students. My colleagues from the media, because I'm a member of the Ghana Journalist Association, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Let me first of all thank the leadership of the university for the honor done the police service 
with this invitation to be here today to deliver this public lecture. And I also would like to thank the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Public Lectures, Lectures Committee for going the extra mile to put this lecture together and make it a reality. And in this vein, I also would like to thank Dr. Jones Opokowari for being the coordinator between the police and the university and putting in all the mechanisms to ensure that we have today and to come and give this lecture. I also would like to thank all of you here present today for finding time to be with us, for us to have this engagement. And particularly, I would like to thank my fellow students. And I hear I will explain my fellow students to be the fact that I have decided not to ever stop being a student. And I'll keep learning. The difference is that I don't have the opportunity of getting up every morning to come to lectures. Neither will I have the opportunity of having new school or classmates, or will there be an examination ahead of me leading to an award of a certificate. But whilst I've chosen to continue to be a student to life, maybe you can consider me as a student at large. And with that in mind, any hall which is interested in me can have me as an unadopted student of the hall. <laughs> Having said this, we came with the blessing of the whole police administration and the entire police force, the police service. That is why you see most of my colleagues here, both from the headquarters and also from the region, accompany me here. And we'll have love to have the fullness of the police leadership to be here. But for one reason or the other, and one assignment and the other, they were unable to come and we have this session representing them. And they have asked me to convey our congratulations to you, the leadership, and the entire university body on the celebration of your 70th anniversary. <clears throat> we are aware that this celebration started somewhere last year, and you are still in the celebration mood. And we wish you well. And we know that the next 70 years will be better than the one that just passed. But the important point that we want to make is the fact that your 70 years has been fabulous, has been impactful. And if you really want to measure it, then I want to probably sum it up in this way. The impact of the university can be felt within every corner of this country and across the globe. And it is on this note that we want to appreciate all those who were the three braces that brought it to the point that you picked it up and you are continuing. And some of them have been called to glory. May they are so rest in, play, in peace. The rest who are not here today are all over the world, within the country and across the world, continuing to preach the things that you taught them, for which you have become always the best in Ghana and the very best also across the African continent. <laughs> now, with all these introductory remarks, let me now turn my attention to why we are here today. And the simple aspect of it is for us to come and have a discussion about the changing face of policing in the country. And as Madam Chairperson said, expectations in the role of the university community. This engagement is relevant because, as we know, policing is and will always be about the people. 
policing will always be about the people. We cannot take that away for even a second. And the beauty of this is this. With this engagement, we are going to work together to continue to sustain the peace of this country in such a way that all of us, individually and collectively, will be able to live our God-given destiny. And if we succeed in this venture of maintaining the peace and tranquility, the stability, orderliness of this country, that will be the greatest tribute and honor to our forebearers who kept the peace for us to come and inherit and enjoy. In the same way, it will also be the greatest inheritance that we can leave for our children and their children. With this in mind, when my colleagues and I took the realm of office to organization to the next level, we decided to put in place pragmatic strategic policy and interventions to build on the good work done by our predecessors so as to be able to get to the point that the peace and stability of the country will be sustained for the good of ourselves in terms of the rest of our life and also for the good of our children. So with this, we therefore decided to embark on a journey of rigorous, pragmatic transformation, building on the work of our forebearers, our former bosses, so that we will become the best institution in this country and a reference point for the rest of the world. And when we say this, we don't say it lightly. It may not happen during our time, but we are very sure and convinced that we will create the environment and position the organization in such a way that nobody can reverse that course of becoming the best institution in the country and a reference point in the world. And how, and how, and how, we are going about it is the story that I'm here today to share with you. So what is the story? The first component of the story is that when we decided to do something pragmatic, something transformational, about policing in the country, we decided that we want to take another critical look at our historical development. And we'll walk you through that. After that walk, we decided to sit back and have an assessment of where we have been in terms of our performance from our point of view and also from the point of view of you our masters whom we serve, so that we would then be in a position to compare notes and see what strategic options are available to us for us to take. And with that mindset, we would then, depending on what strategic option we want to take, re-examine your expectations and then use that expectations to inform our strategic direction and go out there and deliver, with, with deliver on our strategic policy and intervention. And while we do that, then we'll be in a position to ask you to come on board with your responsibility of supporting us because policing is and always be a shared responsibility. So the first block of the story where we are from, our journey. Our journey can be looked from three main angles. 
pre-colonial period, which I call the green period, and the colonial period, which I call the dark ages of our history, and the independent period, which I call the golden age period. And as you all know, before colonialism, it was all about Nananum in the enclave that operates as a kingdom, having some people doing the work of policing to see to the interests of that small group. Then we walk into the environment. Then we walk into the environment where we have the colonial period where the masters, the colonial masters decided to use the police for their own interests and not for the interests of the people. In effect, it was all about protecting their interests and they cared less about the interests of the people. And the third component, the golden age, which we are so struggling to get it right, is to create a police service of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we are on it. So if you want to have pictures of how we've come, how far we've come, let's share a couple of them. And don't laugh at us. The typical environment you will see with where we came from, barefooted in those days. And in modern times, the young ones will be telling us with a song on Namdadi, on Shem Papua. So that is how we started off. And from there, we've journeyed on. We got to a point that we succeeded in at least having some togasses and also because maybe the area was not sufficient for the trousers, we will end up having a long socks to cater for the deficiency of the togas in order to move on. So, actually, you could see that we've come from very far and we are so journeying on. So where are we? We are fortunate to then now have the full complement of a trouser and then some belt and stuff to go. And we were coming to this era where now the full complement of modernization is with us and then we are finding ourselves as an integral part of it. Then you see the police of the people, for the people and by the people, in action, creating a new face for all of us. Then when we have to show force in order to protect your life and property, the full complement of it is also done. Then you also have where we go and try to keep on modernizing for purposes of ensuring that we keep you safe and keep protect your properties at all levels. Then we see all this. The interesting thing is that as we walk through our history, you could feel the presence of multiple police administrations which have come to make huge contribution and of which we are building on. And we can count up to my time 23 of them. And maybe some of you have some of your family members who once headed this organization. And if you have not seen their pictures for a long time, I'm doing you the favor. So you have Mr. Majete, the first Ghanaian IGP, all up to the sixth one, Mr. C.O. Lamte, who passed away a couple of months ago and his funeral is slated for 19th of this month. So we are in funeral mode, and as you always see, we are always in black. So even when we are mourning, we don't even see the difference. But may he so rest in peace. Then we also have from Mr. Che, my father, 
through up to that administration to Nana Usun Sian. Then we have Mr. Champon through to my big brother, Mr. James Opombuenu. And someone will ask, why is that slot empty and your picture is not there? It isn't my responsibility to put my picture there. I have to go on retirement for somebody to carry my picture and put it there. So I look forward to the day that my picture will be there for somebody also to come and continue this job and probably do it better than we are doing it now. Then with this, there has also been serious external interventions with the intention of reforming and modernizing the police service, starting with the Boy Report, the Ryan Report, Tiburu, Okujato, Acha Report, all were tackling one aspect of the police service for purposes of ensuring that we become better and serve you better. And when all is said and done, we came to one conclusion. We have unfortunately or fortunately become a product of our history. So we carry some baggages from the pre-colonial era. We carry some from the colonial era. And the independent aspect is also in there. But we've not been able to find out, to dissect it, to find out which portion of each that we are carrying along. But the beauty of it is that we'll keep improving and taking off the things that we think will not help us. And then making sure that the product that we put it out there for you will be a product that you admire and you're always wanting to ask for more. But with this, just then, after that, we decided to do a complete assessment of what exactly has been achieved. And from our perspective, we thought that we have achieved a lot because we believe we are living our mandate, especially when you compare us to other countries within the sub-region and beyond, with now ranking us as the second best in Africa, the eighth and all that. The beauty of it is this. We also keep expanding. We also keep expanding across the country as far as resource may permit it. And with all this expansion, anytime we are involved in an international assignment, people don't want us to leave. They want us to be there. And at times, when we see how back home we are treated, at times we feel that, why don't we stay there forever? But home is home. And at times it also reminds us of the saying that a prophet is never accepted in his own time. But we are Ghanaians first, and it is you who have employed us, and we own our services to you, and if you are not satisfied, we need to get on with it. So with all this, we decided also to assess ourselves from your perspective. And this is what we found. We found that in the middle, you said we are still underperforming. Okay, and he said that we show zero partnership. We don't work with you. It's like you are mining your business, or we are also mining our business, and we have become so reactive when something, nothing is happening. Everybody is on his own, and therefore you don't feel that we are providing a service to you. Also, there are issues where you see us as very unprofessional. And in some cases, to consider us an occupying force. And an occupying force in the sense that just now, but for this purpose, if I happen to be here and walk into a lecture hall, as soon as I enter, you get asking, I then have cost. But we were thinking that seeing a police officer should rather bring relief. And we'll get there where you see as more of a friend than as an occupying force. So the still assessment from your perspective. The other aspect, which is in green, is that we are corrupt. Thank you. A problem identified is have the solution. We've never said that they are not 
a couple of people who are doing things in a corrupt way, tarnishing the image of the service. We've never said that. We are doing all what we can to handle it. But we will never accept the fact that we are the most corrupt institution in the country. It is unfounded. Because all those researches have challenged methodologies. And at the appropriate time, we'll keep responding to them. But we also will keep working at the things that people over the years have used it against us and make us feel so uncomfortable when it comes to the issue of corruption. And when we get there, you will surely know that we have arrived. And we will get there. That I can assure you. So what do we see? We see, and these are not English words, but we are interested in the missus, the, the word after the missus. We would have loved to have the trust, the confident respect, and the legitimacy that we need badly. But from all the feelings that we get, you've seen that we've missed your trust, we've missed your confidence, We've missed your respect, and it has weakened our legitimacy. That is the feeling. And we will not run away from them. Because we are doing introspection. For us to be able to get the strategic focus to turn the corner, so that we can then separate the misses from the other part of the world, and we have those ones standing alone. And for some of you who are now over age, cannot join the police, to be very uncomfortable that now the police has become so attractive that you wish you were younger for you to join it. So all this, what has happened? There has been a very big expectation gap. We think that we are almost there. But the people we serve think otherwise, that we are not there yet. So the question that we ask ourselves, should we mind the gap? Should we mind the gap? And doing that, we came to the realization that we have some strategic options. We can choose to do nothing. It's also those students of strategy will tell you. It's also an option. Or we can use the propagandist approach. Pretend to be doing something. Or tell, we do everything possible everything humanly possible. So these were the options open to ask my colleagues and I in formulating the strategic interventions to turn around the corner and build on the foundation of our forebearers being our for, former bosses. So what informed the choice that we made? About four things. The first thing is that we are employees of yours. That's why we are called public servant. And anytime you see the word servant, you must be looking for the master. And you are the masters. So if your masters say they are not happy with you and you are a servant and you want to keep your job, what do you do? You must do something special if you really love your job. So we thought that we have to remember that in making a choice as to doing nothing, pretend to be doing something, or doing anything everything humanly possible. The next thing that we also saw was that we went around and be looking for a very good musician. May he so rest in peace. If you do good, you do for yourself. And that statement is very loaded. We saw that very soon we'll become civilians one more time. So if we mess up with the quality of policing, it will catch up with us. We also saw that our children, our parents, our brothers and sisters, our aunties, they are not in uniform. They are also experiencing the same quality of policy. So whatever we have to do, and we think that we are doing it to improve the police service, we don't do it for anybody, but we do it for ourselves. Then the next point that we realized is that there is always and here we mean always room for improvement. 
you can always achieve more than what you have achieved. So we didn't want to end it there. So we picked it up. And the final thing that informed us in terms of what we're supposed to do and the decision that we need to make is the fact that if we were to follow the way we are verifying at times to the level that demotivates us so much, then we'll choose not to do anything. But we remembered that prosperity is the best stage. And if we do this, we'll be out there satisfying everybody. So with this in mind, we decided to do everything humanly possible to transform the police service to a level that will be appreciable to all and sundry. And doing that, we decided to take a second look at your expectations. And we saw that, oh, we are manager. All what you have to do is to put our hearts to them and we get them done. You just want to be protected and your property protected. You just want a secure and peaceful community. You want an equip equitable application of the law. You want to ask to get the few bad guys out of the service so that our name is what polished. And more importantly, you want to partner with us. And whether the person is a suspect or a complainant, a witness or whatever, you expect us to treat those people with respect and dignity. With this on our minds, we then begin, began the other chapter of our story. And that was to do with the strategic interventions that you have seen us implementing. And here, there are so many of them, but I'm going to speak to only those that we are implementing because we are using the concept of a bed in hand is better than 20 or 30 in the, on a tree somewhere on the streets. But the beauty of it is that we looked at it from what is it that we have to do internally to handle the situation and what is it that we have to do externally to also handle the situation and then improve and serve you better. The first one is having a leadership driven command and control culture. The second one is you see into the personal development and the welfare of the personnel. And the third one is ensuring police professional standards and accountability. So I will cite a few of the things that we are currently doing when it comes to the first one. We have instituted a practical leadership driven command and control culture at all levels of the service, such that personnel at all levels of the service are clear in their minds what needs to be done and see to it that appropriate steps are taken to get it done. So that you don't need to overly wait for anybody to give you direction. You are a leader at every level that you find yourself. Then the second thing we've done along that chain is to ensure that each one of us at all the chain is appropriately empowered such that as long as you do what is right and you do it professionally, you have, we will have your back and to the level that now there is a culture that everybody is arrestable, even including the IGP. So what it is is that just do what is right in respect of your rank and you have the full backing of the whole police administration and nobody can intimidate you. And on that score, if we are to give you a list of people who have been arrested left, right, center, to shock you, now you arrest people and say, please, no noise about it. Take me to court. Everything thereof, I'll sort it out. But at first, when we started, you arrested one person, the people say political. You arrested a second person, they say he, he, another political. He's got, now, they have all come to see and know that we didn't come just for one or two things. We came to maintain that consistency. The other thing we have done in that context, the same command and control, is to create an environment where there is recognition, there is reward and punishment in a transparent way. So that when you know that you are doing what is right, your normal promotion will come, but there will be additional promotion for you because we want to eat to serve as what? 
a motivation for others to know that beyond your normal things, if you do extraordinary things, you will benefit or get extraordinary benefit. In the same way, the punishment is there. On the same note, with the same command and control, we have also done it in such a way that there is a coordinated, consultative approach where we make sure that any time any policy intervention is being implemented, all the command levels to the lowest at the station, inputs are gotten from them, so that we have a portfolio of ideas that are pulled together in order to turn the corner of the organization and also to let everybody who is responsible to ensuring its implementation feel a part owner of it, so that he is not left behind. And the final thing I'll say under that is also the issue of leadership by example at the very top in a united, in a teamwork faction that is also cascading towards all levels across the country. So that is the first one in terms of leadership driven command and control. The next one is to do with personnel development and welfare. And here, a few things I will say. The first one in terms of the develop, personnel development. Recent recruitment that we, we did, did you see how we handle it? Humanely, you come, the time that you're supposed to show up, you come and you are dealt with in an environment that makes you feel comfortable. Then the whole process, and together with vetting in a manner for us to get the best. Because if you start getting that aspect right, then you will have less work in trying to what? get to the level of professionalism that we are looking at. The second thing that we've done in that environment is the issue of ensuring that all the trainings at all the level, recruit level, senior officers level, in-service training, we've changed everything to 75 to 80 percent practical, 20 percent theoretical. And for the first time in the history of this country, and probably in Africa and beyond, you have police officers who have passed out from training, they know how to ride, they know how to drive, they know how to swim. So now you will not see a police officer and think that you are a swimmer, you go across. By the time you are already in the river, we are ahead of you. And if you have to do hand coffee in the river too, we have the expertise to do that. And if you have 5,000 of us with that expertise, imagine it multiply effect. The other point we have done is also to expose everybody to have the opportunity to go for UN mission and international assignment so that you get international exposure and have it to come influence the job that you do. Now in the area of welfare, if I'm to list, let me quickly list a few of the interventions you've done there. The first one is that we have established regional welfare directorates across the whole country or all the police regions, 18 of them. There are regional welfare directories out there supporting. And we have also instituted mechanisms to ensure that all indisposed police officers are visited. I started doing it myself across the country. Regional commanders are doing it. District commanders are doing it. Divisional commanders are doing it. We have institutionalized it such that they will feel that if you do something and you are incapacitated, we will always be there for you and you will not be abandoned. We haven't ended it there. We have also established what we call Police Emergency Medical Intervention Fund with a seed money of $1 million. And it was launched by His Excellency the President. And with that, anybody who gets injured in line of duty within 24 hours, maximum of 48 hours, every help that you need wherever it is in this world will be provided without any delay. And currently, we have had three of our officers who have benefited from it, and the money is invested in a manner that it will keep what? Growing, and we'll make sure that as long as you work for us and you have an issue, we will not wait for you to wait for years before you are supported. Closely related to that is also the establishment of virtual police medical center, where wherever you are across the country, as long as you're a police officer, you can assess medical care at the police hospital just by the touch of a button. And probably this could be the first in the public sector, because I know other private sectors are also doing that. In addition to that, we have also instituted a policy of retirement 
planning in such a way that we help them to transit from working into retirement seamlessly. And we do that with a, a course and a program going around the country preparing the minds of those who are retiring. And also we add to it that any time you are retiring, one to two years towards your retirement, you have the opportunity to tell us where you want to settle. So you send you close to the place you want to settle so that you start acclimatizing to the exit. In addition to that, we have also decentralized pension processing. And how was it done in the past? In the past, you can come from my very good friend's hometown at Fumbisi to come to Accra to process your pension. And the story at times we do here is that you will succeed in coming to Accra. When you get to Circle, then you are in Accra all right. But Circle, you hear people saying Accra, Accra, Accra. And you are not sure whether you have landed at the wrong place. But fortunately, with this decentralization, where we go to the people at the regional level, and very soon we are sending it down to where you actually work, so that you not even travel from, say, a village to the regional capital, but you come to you and have your pension process to make sure that you need not to travel in order to get on to retirement. It becomes so inconvenient. Then the last one about all this is the issue of the way we treat people who die in line of duty. We have revolutionized the environment to the level that what we do is to ensure that when you die online, in line of duty, with all the courtesies that we give you, we also open the opportunity for a child of yours or a brother of yours who qualifies to be recruited to take your place whenever there is a recruitment process ongoing. So that that child continues the work you couldn't finish because of your untimely death, which was also in line with what? Duty. And it more or less like a way of pacifying the family for their loss. We know we cannot bring the human being back. Let me end it there and probably focus on the other thing which will be of interest to you. But you could see that with the first one, leadership driven command and control, with the things we are doing with professional de I mean personal development, you see that automatically it's in lieu to the benefit of professional standards and accountability. But beyond that, we are doing certain things specific. The first one, we are working closely to ensure that each and every one of us is conscientized, sensitized in a way that they become very careful the way we deal with the public. And that has led to all of us having our name tags woven, not just like a name tag on a plate. Now you, can, you cannot remove it from the uniform. And we have finished with the sensitization, and very soon, every police officer that you see will mention his name, his station that he's coming from, and we do all these things before interacting with you. And we have a hotline. We have seen that it's not working the way we want. We are now making it a smart hotline, and I think it will be 7,000, whereby if you don't get it from that angle, you can easily call for us to verify for you and make sure that we do what is right. In the same area of professional standards, we have also worked on the policy of ensuring that we have regional professional standard bureaus established to bring that closer to the public so that you don't need to all the time come to Accra or write a petition. You can work in any of the offices that is established in the region. But the important thing about that one is also the fact that we have tried to make sure that the cases that come to us, those cases are investigated and the families are supported in some cases, supporting the medical care, I mean the medical bills, in some cases providing social circle, I mean social circle support, and in some cases to making sure that the right thing is done and the people are punished. But at times, when this thing is happens and we are doing it, we understand the apprehension of the public. They wish that instantly something is done and the punishment is meted out. We can't do that. There is rule of law. And it has to go through a process. 
And if we fail working along the process, then what is going to happen is that the person, after every punishment that you might have probably given him, the person, the punishment in any court of competent jurisdiction will be quashed, and the person will come back. So we follow due processes. So it's not that when it happens and the person is interdicted and the processes are followed, we end it there. We don't. We make sure that the right thing is done. So let me sum up in terms of all the things that we are doing internally to strengthen ourselves so as to be able to then go out there and police. Now let me go external. In the external environment, these are the four things that we are working on. The first one is community engaging policing. The second one is scientific, intelligent-led policing operations. The third one is transportation safety and management, and proactive transportation safety and management. And the fourth one is deepening interagency collaboration. Let me take a few slaps on the issue of the, the community engaging policing. The community engaging policy, we keep deepening the number of police officers we put out there. Now we have added the motorbikes bit to it, and very soon we are deploying almost about 2,000 motorbikes across the country to take care of all highways and all that. We have also looked at the, all the issue of adding the dogs, adding the horses to make sure that we come closer and closer to you for you to feel secure. And beyond this, we are also doing what we call proactive engagement. And one of such proactive engagement is our being here today, where we are engaging you, not because something has happened, but we are engaging you for us to be on the same page, for us to collaborate, and therefore for us to be able to know what is happening in your community, and for us to provide the policing that is specific and targeted to the needs of your community. And in addition to that, we are also working on what we call reactive engagement. The reactive engagement is where something has happened. And you see that the district commander will show up there, the divisional commander will come, the regional commander will come, and in some cases, either the IGP himself will come, depending on the magnitude of the issue, or the IGP will take a phone call and call. And here we want to put on record that in all major cases, the victims and the people involved, in 90% of the cases, I personally call all of them and engage them and to put them ahead in terms of the way we want to deal with the matter. And it's something that is institutionalized in a way that district commanders are doing it, divisional commanders, and everybody is doing it. And we've done it in such a way that even the engagement has been done in such a way that the regional commander, once in every month, you should be able to go around all your region. Divisional commander, once in every two weeks, you should be able to go every corner of your division. District commander, once every week, you should be able to go every corner of your district so that the people will see us more and if they have issues, we are there also to address them. We have also looked at the issue of engaging in terms of our media relations and in terms of sharing information. And now if those of us who follow us in terms of our releases, you see that in respect of the time of the day, the time of the night, if incident happen, we will get information from us in terms of what is happening. And these are all forms of engagement to bring in you closer. Now let me tackle the issue of Strategic, scientific, intelligent policing operations. Let me mention about three of the things that we've done in that angle. The first one is that we have established regional intelligent departments across all the police regions. Because intelligence is everything. When you get intelligence right, the whole work is reduced in terms of any other thing that you do. And some of the intelligent people, if I tell you the things that you do, it will map for you. So whenever you take some of the taxis, you never know who is driving you. A thief tells you. And whenever you take an Okada, which is not legalized, but because we are penetrating, you never know who is on it. But the point we want to make is that, for your sake, we are everywhere watching and keeping the bad guys at bay. The other thing, on the same stretch that we are doing is the cultivation of informants across the country and the pool of informants that we have, which we have commercialized and what I call cash and carry, you make sure that you bring the information, the information is authentic, we operationalize the information, we get the results, come for your 1,000 up to 50,000. 
because that is how committed we are in protecting you. And if I'm to tell you, because of intelligence, we don't talk, the people on their payroll, maybe you take it as a second job. <laughs> but these are all the things that we are doing behind the scene to keep you safe. In addition to that, we are also doing a very comprehensive tactical hotspot policing. All the places that has become problematic for robbery, for conflict and all that, the type of deployment we put there, special forces we put there, and the results that we are getting from Begro to Donkokrum to Yeji to KJG, Kintampo, Bupe, Tamari. Just name them. When was the last time you heard of any serious robbery on this street? When you raise your head, or they were dead. And that is what we are doing to keep you safe. Beyond that, we have also done so much in the area of establishing certain unique and specialized units. One of them is missing person unit. For the first time in the history, we have that. Because we want to be able to account for every missing person and trace them as long as it takes and, and get them united with their families. And if we are unable to do that on our watch, make sure that somebody to come with a framework in place to come and continue from where we left off. The other thing we are doing in that same context, which we thank this university, especially the Department of Engineering for, is since we established a cold case unit for the first time in the history of the police service, to tackle all cases that, especially murder cases that have gone undetected over the years, we've had tremendous support from your university, and especially the Department of Engineering. And on this note, I would like to thank Professor Kokuo, Professor Kouwa, Professor Kwe Ballard, and Professor Se Jr. and their teams for the wonderful job they are doing in supporting the course that we are working on. And we have been working tirelessly on this. And we know we will succeed in finding the killers of some of these individuals. And when we are unable to succeed in finding the killers for all of them, the structures and the system we put in place with the preservation of the evidence and information, anybody who is committed to this cause will come and continue and will be able to get there to the level that everybody will know. If you commit a crime, in respect of how long it takes, we'll find you and we'll bring you to justice. In the area of transportation, proactive transportation management and safety and management, at times, we always think that it's all about road safety, road, road. There is also, uh, even though we don't go that, uh, there that often, there is also rain. And equally, there is also uh, the water bodies. And I want to tell you that, especially starting with this, the water bodies, we have started working and putting more of our marine people in place. And with 5,000 of our people now knowing how to swim, imagine the magnitude of it. We are going to cover all our water bodies and ensure that when you are on it, you are fully secured. But on the issue of the road, you see that we've done a whole lot. When we came in, we saw that the most, the, 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 the motorbikes were on top in terms of fatalities when it comes to accidents. And we put in place what we call police action against rider indiscipline. Where now you could see a whole bunch of the motorbike drive riders being on their helmet, having their motorbike registered, insured, they get red light, they try to stop nowadays. We haven't gotten there yet, but we are getting there. And even the little we have done and achieved, with the latest figures from the National Road Safety Commission, we said that even fatalities in respect of motor accidents have reduced by 12%. So if we can achieve that within the shortest possible time, by the time the year-end figure, figures come, I think we'll be all up there and a similar program has been, been put in place called the Police Invisible Eye Type, where we have taken off all the MTT guys from the road, and we have put in place vehicles with cameras, flying the roads, we won't tell you where they are. And if we are also to tell you the amount of money that we have gotten from indisciplined drivers on the roads across the country from this type program, program it will marvel you. Another thing we put in place is also indiscipline within our cities 
where people are using the middle of the road, left, right, center. Nowadays, whoever you are, you try it. And the next hour, we take you to court. The beauty of it is that the law allows us to impound your car and wait for the termination of the court. And we get an order from the court to remove the stop light, the siren, and everything before the car is released to you. So at times, now the courts, because of the workload, they are taking the cases on the average of about six. So if you are lucky, maybe for two weeks, you have your car with us. So in the quest to save 15 minutes, you have ended up having your car impounded. Both big men, small men, everybody is a victim. Everybody, is not, everybody who has actually abused the law in that respect is arrested. And if we are to give you a list, and I mean if we are to give you a list, and I really mean if we are to give you a list, you will say that we are almost there. You want some list? Tomorrow. On the other point is to do with the issue of deepening interagency. But one last thing before I move on, the deepening interagency cooperation, something that is so dear to our hearts, but which we have not been able to convince all the transport union to fully bring it on board. It's called Passenger Lieutenant Officer Program. We think that when you take a bus or any commercial vehicle, because you pay for it, the moment that the car is taking you from where you took it to your destination, you are a co-owner of the vehicle. So the driver cannot drive anyhow. Your life is in their hands. You pay for it. And therefore, until it takes you to your destination, together with the owner, you own the vehicle. So if that is the case, then somebody among you, the passengers, should be able to be appointed as a liaison officer between yourself and the driver and the union or the station that you pay the car and probably where you are going. So that if the driver is not driving well, carelessly, inconsiderately, then you should be in a position to question the driver. So we will not accept this. And I speak on behalf of the passengers. We launched this, a VVIP took it on board, and we are still refining it to see how we can make it across all of them. So that at the end of the day, you get to the station, all what you are looking for is that one of you will be appointed as what? Passengers liaison officer, and when the driver is not respecting your intervention, you should be able to call the station that you loaded, park the car somewhere, for the station people to get you another car from the nearest union station to take you to your destination. And when we do that, the drivers will start behaving and will not be overtaking where you're supposed not to overtake. And unfortunately, at the time when they do that, and you get a very committed person who wants to live to the fullness of his God-given destiny, questioning the driver, the same passengers who say, oh, so proud, then I So let's work on that, and I think it will be fantastic, and it will reduce this carnage on our roads to an appreciable level. Now let me conclude on this issue by looking at deep intelligence cooperation, which, of course, you know we've been doing across in terms of intelligence sharing with other security agencies and operations, especially in this era of terrorism, that we do it across to make sure that we continue to keep you safe and keep the country secure and peaceful. Now, one other thing which cut across both internal and external is how we apply ICT in the work that we do. And there, what we are seeing is that with a, internally we've done a little more, but there is so much to be done. But externally, I don't think we've done well at all because we are looking forward to a period where we'll have virtual police station where you need not to show up at the police station, you just make your complaint virtually, and then we'll send you all the information, Then we can even virtually also invite the suspect to put his case across. And when we evaluate it and think it's something that we can virtually do it, and it is resolved and it's a win-win for everybody, than to show up at the police station hours unattended to and all that. So we have a lot of work to do. But internally, with the press of a button, the IGP can send messages to every police officer across the country instantly. And we are also working where now we have virtually a sufficient level of paperless environment across the country. From headquarters to the regional level, we send documents electronically that we need not to find people to come pick it up and do that. So we are doing a whole bunch in that area. 
and we will keep improving. Now, and now, the question is, why we are doing all this in order to keep safe? We are not there yet. There is so much we want to do, and we keep working at it. But at least the little we've heard today should indicate to you that we are overly committed. We are overly committed in living our mandate. But we know one thing. We cannot do it alone. We cannot do it alone. And you need to help us. And why do you want to help us? Because if we work together, the bad guys suffer. But if we fight, the bad guys are strengthened. And with the nature of criminality and the boldness of the people in the way they deal with us, if we don't work together, it will not be good for all of us. And more so, when in a gun battle, whoever presses the trigger first gets the ghost. So at times we hear when we are doing these things of fighting these bad guys, and because they are not using toy guns, and because whoever presses the trigger first gets the ghost. The question that I always ask, do you want them to kill us for them to protect you? Or when they are trying to take our life, for us to be smarter so that we continue to protect you? And I want to show you a footage as a way of probably having a bit of a break. Relax and just watch it. It's not a movie. But viewers' discretion is advised. This is a robbery scene that I would like to watch in soberness. Where are we take it from there? This is not a movie. This happened close to Professor Tia Champon's hometown. And that is a human being who has been shot through the stomach and instantly fell on the ground and is agonizingly dying. And you have people robbing, inhumanely looking at somebody dying, and just going along looking for papers called money. And please, for the media, we don't want this one to go because we are in an academic environment. That's why we are showing it. It's not meant for public consumption, please. There is somebody in there. The only thing that saved the person's life is that he's the only person who can help them to get access to the money because after all the firing, they couldn't go to the next door. So they tax the person to virtually move the money from where it is and give it to them if she wants it. He, he wants to save his life.
So if we have happened to be at the scene, and with the type of AK-47 that they are using, we are also using the same weapon. And then we'll beg them that, oh, please don't kill them. Come, let's go to the police station. Because they are nice people. And the amount of money being kept there also shows lack of security consciousness on the part of the owners of it. But how do you bring a victim and add to his or her solo? He has saved his life. Now he's checking to see what happens. So let me shift it. So would pain take her 10 months, 10 weeks, intelligent-led operations? These people are gone. They have run away. And we don't have a system in this country where you can easily use to identify people. So you need to get these people arrested, one or the other, using some way beyond imagination and understanding. And thereafter, use the same people to help you to identify the addicts. And at times when you are identifying them on the stretch of the operation, and you have, say, about six bulletproof vests, and you are ten people going, people at times expect us to give the bulletproof vests to the criminals who are going to help us to show the place so that we'll go without the bulletproof. So that when we wear it and go with them and conduct the operations, and our time in the midst of exchange of fire, that person pass on, passes on. Then the question comes that somebody is in your custody. How can he die? Because we don't understand the dynamics and we have not taken our time to ask the serious questions. If we have all the databases to identify people, you mention his name, his hometown, and just go and find out. You, the person I've arrested, just be at bay. But it will take only you in our current environment to help me identify the people we need. And on this operation, some of our people have to behave like madmen in communities. Some of them have to do shushan. Some of them have to set up a small table to do momo transfer in order to arrest the first one. And then move on to get so far four of them. We are just looking for three of them. And we are showing it today because we know we are going to get them. So we want to assure you this. We don't take our job for granted. So when issue come out, listen to our side before you conclude. Other than that, we get demotivated every day. And if you keep on demotivating us and we keep becoming weaker, the bad guys keep becoming emboldened. That's why daytime they can walk into a community by Accra Kumasi Highway and commit this with impunity and kill two people just because of papers call money. So you see why you need to help us? Go over the individual level and at the university community level. So how do you do that? We think that there are three levels of that help. The first one is what is it that you have to do for yourself? The second one is what is it that you have to do for others? And the third one is what is it that you have to do directly for us? But this is the magic. Anything that you do for yourself directly affects the others indirectly and beneficially and is also lessen our work and support us. In the same way, whatever you do for somebody directly affects you indirectly and also affects the police directly. And finally, whatever you do for the police directly affects you indirectly and somebody also indirectly. So in that triangular setup, we are all winners if we choose to be helping ourselves. So I'll say only a few things under this and then I'll conclude. The first bit of the help for yourself 
is that we should individually have a security mindset. We don't have it. We have totally outsourced our security to somebody else and minding our own business. That's why in all economic textbooks before until recently, security was never a, an issue. All the factors of production, factors of socioeconomic development, you never saw security until recently people are trying to do research and trying to look at the analysis between socioeconomic development and security. In the same way, because of our lack of security mindedness, we will build communities and when we finish with all the land, then we claim we need police. And when we come around, we are not finding land. They say, let's find some container and put the police in. When did we become a cargo? Lack of security mindedness. When you get that consciousness and you apply it, you keep growing in nature and you become a master of it. And then you can then handle every situation around you. And that lack of consciousness, except those who have been coming to this room regularly, I don't know how many of you know how many steps to the app there. How many of the steps? Some of you might have been here for years. You have no idea how many steps you have to take to get to the top. You don't even know how many exits in case something happened, where you came out, you came through, where else you can go, how many of them are available, and which of the windows are capable of giving you an exit route. We just came. Lack of that security mindedness. So we are in it. We are in it and we are so exposed that when we are in a room and we sit down and we walk into a room, then you see somebody sitting with a back facing the exit. Oh, you see what is coming. So as for you, you, you are just a gift to whoever wants to attack you. You walk on the street and you know that where you are going to walk alone, there will be a problem. Yet you are on your phone, chatting. And the next hour when your phone is taken, then you are crying. So all this is what is lost on us. And the final thing about what you can do for yourself is the fact that don't be the source of the problem. Don't be the thief. Don't be the aggressor. And don't cause the confusion. In the same vein, what is it that you can do for others? The first one, help them to develop their security mindedness and apply it. We have mothers, we have fathers, we have brothers, we have sisters, we have cousins, we have aunties, we have uncles. With the knowledge we have, if all of them are pushed to be aware of their security and be minded of their environment and not to expose themselves to threats, then we'll build a critical mass of security mindedness university community we will bear a critical mass of security minded named Ghanaian community and therefore we will be alert and then reduce the possibility of attack by the bad ones and also strengthen policing so that the resources we could use probably to handle some of the things we then use them concentrating on others. And the other thing you can do for others is also supporting them that they will not become the reference points of the problems. Now let me finally move on into the issue of what you can do for the police and then I'll say a few words and conclude. The first one, from the personal level, please criticize us. Criticize us, criticize us, criticize us. Because it is true that criticism that will learn the relevant lessons and become better. But once again, please, let your criticism be constructive. Don't just criticize as a messenger who have heard something and running with it. And then they ask him, now nah, almost then, ah, maybe I could see a man saying it can be na me and is it police for now you say na me can be. Let it be constructive. So that we can be encouraged to learn the relevant lessons and we keep improving and serve you better. Two. Two, try and be our informant, either on pro bono or on commercial basis, and ready to work with you 
in order to keep you safe. Three, when you become a complainant or a witness in a matter, support us to carry the case to its logical conclusion so that it will deter the criminals from acting. But you report the case today, tomorrow you say you are tired, police cannot proceed with the case without your consent, without your support. And when that comes, the criminal himself felt that you don't even have time, so that any time I rob, and the matter even go to court, the court will be calling, calling, and the case will be strike out. That is not helpful. That is not just helpful. The other point is that encourage others who have knowledge about things to contact us and work with us. And it will help all of us. Now let me say three things about what the university as a community can do in support of us. Beyond the criticism, which of course we know yours have always been constructive and it helps us to improve. That's why we welcome the partnership that we are going to develop going forward. And I think it will be phenomenal. But we want to see whether you can consider introducing a mandatory course on security awareness. So that, I don't know how it's going to be done, so that people will take it and create that awareness and then they come every day thinking about security. The second one, we want, and we have started with this, uh, the Faculty of Social Sciences, where we want to see a collaborative partnership on research that will help us to develop homegrown strategic policing solutions that will go out there to implement, to improve policing in the country for the good of all of us. And the other one is where you work with us, like Professor Foucault and his team are working with us in the area of solving crimes where you have the competencies in helping us to unravel. And when we do this, I can assure you, criminals themselves will change their behavior without anybody prompting them. So to conclude, to conclude, let me say a few words. And that will also be an advice to all of us, and more importantly, to my fellow students. In fact, we are here now, now. It's just because we are waiting to die later in the day, or probably tomorrow. And if tomorrow comes and we're still alive, it's just that our tomorrow has not come. And it will definitely come and nobody can stop it. That is the mindset we need to walk around with. And in my case, every Friday and Saturday, I use it as a yardstick for measuring my level of humanity, considering the number of people who will be taken from the mock and the number of people who will be swallowed by the earth without any return. So when that happens, this is the next thing you see. You will be gone. And definitely, you will be forgotten. But the interesting thing is that how soon you are forgotten is driven by whether you are selfish or selfless. How soon you will be forgotten is driven by whether you are selfish or selfless. In result to how rich you might have been, if you become selfless, the day you are buried will be the day that you will be forgotten. But if you are selfless, selfish, the day you are buried, the day you are forgotten, but selfless people, you will be remembered for a while, and they occasionally you will be forgotten, and they occasionally when we want good-mannered people, important life people, you will be remembered. And that is the key to prosperity. So young guys, my advice to you is that a lot of people came before you through this university. They are gone and forgotten. All the confusion they came to create at the university, they are so have been forgotten. So if you are here and you think that you don't want to work and accomplish your God-given destiny, 
and you rather want to follow grouping and do things to undermine the sanctity of the university community, remember, you'll be forgotten by the authorities, but whatever you did will follow you wherever you go. And if the people who used to be doing the bad things and creating the confusion and showing the disrespect to the teachers who give you the knowledge to go out there to find work, you are able to follow all of them, they will tell you how much they have regretted their actions. So don't fall into that trap. And concentrate on your books. And walk out there to add to the impact that the university is making after 70 years in existence. Because the day that as human beings we recognize how pitiable we are, there are times you look at it and when you pass on, a typical case of a goat passing on and everybody is happy because there is goat meat to be shared. But the human being passes on and even a partner is afraid to enter the room that they share together. And even when they see the cloth, the dresses of the partner, he or she runs away. And when you are a regular visitor to the mall, and you have had the opportunity of experiencing postmortems on multiple times, I can count not probably many, maybe about 60, 70, and I'm still counting. But I know the doctors, the pathologists, as for them, at times I ask them, so bro, how do you survive? So if you put all these things together, you see that the only thing you have to do is to impart the life of others, is to be disciplined, and is to be humble and respectful. People who stand in front of you to teach you and give you knowledge, you disrespect them. In respect of probably one or two issues that you may have, and you think that you will get away with it. It doesn't work that way. It is on Ghanaian. Let us stop it. Other than that, we will have issues in the future and then we will not be happy with ourselves. Finally, as I conclude, I want to say, as it is, your expectations will continue to be our mandate. And we hope our expectations will continue to be your responsibility so that together we can keep this country safe and secure as a tribute to our forebearers and also as an inheritance to our children. I thank you very much. applause. Please be seated. So our lecture on changing face of policing in Ghana, expectations and role of the university community has been delivered by our speaker, the Inspector General of the Ghana Police Service, Dr. George. Ekufu Dampare, a round of applause again. So we've heard a lot, we've learned a lot. I got something that Mozart and myself will develop a memo on very soon. That's the situation where you pass out in the line of duty, the family will have to consider. So I don't know who. We'll... Mozart, a good memo, right? Yeah, so we'll send it to VC. So I've been told that the IGP will take five questions, only five, related to his presentation. He will address them, and, and the vice chancellor makes a presentation. So wherever it is you are, just raise your hand. From the university community, raise your hand. A microphone will be brought to you. We'll take note of all the five questions and get him to address all of them one after the other. So, um, Dr. Abavari, Professor Abavari, 
Uh, we'll take the first question from you, please. Thank you very much. The speaker, I'm really overwhelmed by the talk. Uh, the kind of mindset I used to have about the police, I think it has changed. <laughs> and especially the video I just saw actually broke my heart. To that extent, I'm really, really touched. The risk you and your men are going through, I salute. But just a quick one is both concern and question. The concerns, maybe I will speak for others. You spoke a bit about it, about the uh, wheel of justice being slow. And the wheel of justice being slow is understood. But sometimes, in the course of waiting, it appears to us as it being overly delayed. And when that happened, people then begin to throw the salvos against the police for being overly slow. And so that's a general concern to our members. Then what is my main question is, when you look at the video, these guys are holding sophisticated weapons. And these weapons, I'm not sure whether it's really available to the general public to go and buy and maybe to license it. And if the general public cannot acquire those weapons from the shelf, the question is, how did they get those weapons? This AK-47. How did it get to them? Is it because they have been imported from the fringes of our borders? Or some people used to perceive that perhaps the police service rather lend it, according to the miscreant, I mean the bad boys, the bad boys also within the police service might have lent them to these same people. So I would be very grateful if you actually could clarify this perception. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. We'll take another question. Okay, please give the microphone to our dad and IGP. I describe myself as a troublesome boy. So I will ask you some troublesome questions. The first item has to do with your green age, black age, golden age. And I'm not too sure of what the green age is, but it appears someone changed the green age to black age. And you happily call the person who changed the green age to black age your master, my master, our master. Right or wrong, I cannot be sure. And for how long can that master be the master who changed the green to black? The golden age part has to do with if we see gold as money, how much of the gold is in the pocket of the average police person? How much of the gold enters the pocket of the policeman for him to feel energetic enough to police me and police us. The last part is why should you be in black and black, black and black, in the tropical Ghanaian weather? Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see your hand up. Do we have the hand of any lady? We are not having ladies. Oh, okay, so we have a lady there. Yes. So please, I have two questions to ask. And my first question is, security cameras we know are available at some regions, but its offices are in Accra. 
but I stand to be corrected on that. So how can the security agencies respond quickly to criminal activities if they don't have the means to witness it in the case where there are no witnesses? And my second question is, how effective is the response of the police in fighting crimes, especially murder, as we actually view the video, where before the arrival of the police, most of the evidence is likely to be tempered by suspects or by tenders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so two more. Mr. Kwame Yeboa, and then we go to the extreme end. Thank you very much. Mine is a request for an audience with the IGP after the program. I would just need some two minutes for us to have a discussion and observation I've made. I wouldn't want to make it here. Thank you very much. So we go to the extreme end. Somebody is holding the microphone there. Where is it? So please go. Hello. Okay. Um, good evening. And please, my question is, um, as of October 2017, um, the Agon IGP, that is Dr. Uh, Mr. David uh, Asante, a PA2, came to Kenya University to unveil the forensic lab laboratory at the College of Science. So I would like to ask that in your position as now the IGP, uh, is there any other alternatives or measures that you would put in place to deepen um, such a lab that was uh, being uh, unveiled in Kenya University? Thank you. Right, so our last question. Oh, uh, Sapon. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. My question is very simple. Looking, <laughs> looking at the current population of Kenya University, which stands at over 86,000, and the population of police at the Oforikrom Municipal, can we say that the ratio of police to student is okay in your perspective? And if not, what are you doing or going to do in order to augment for this huge uh, ratio gap? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll end here and then he will address all the questions. Thank you. So the first question. The ones that I will not be able to remember the item, but I'll try my best. The first one is to do the delays that probably general concern. And we agree that when the delay comes, the public becomes uncomfortable. But now we have introduced mechanisms where we engage the family and give them a liaison officers who constantly brief them about the case. Because we believe that the public have so many important things to follow up than for us to come every week and tell them 17 cases, that is where we are. But if we target the affected family directly, then the concerns will be dealt with. But we're also working on a system such that at the appropriate time, quarterly or half yearly or something, issues that came out to the public domain after the families have been engaged. Because it is also part of our professional standard setting environment that we will not come out, for instance, if somebody has issues with the police and we are dealing with it and we have some information, we will make sure that we share them with the affected families first and then go public rather than doing the opposite, say so that they will hear it only in the media. Actually, in the same vein, whenever there is an issue like this, we make sure that at the end of the day, when the family even inform, we ask them whether it's something that they want us to go public so that we manage their concern, considering the fact that we live in a very traditional society. On the issue of the weapons, the interesting thing is that all the points that you raised could be a factor but the scale of it is what is the differentiation that brings the differentiation. We live in an environment where Ghana is just an island in the midst of a turbulent region. And definitely, 
you should expect with the porous borders, some of these people coming in, and especially when they are coming in from all different angles. There are also instances where, at times, police people are attacked. Where you have an instance in Zualugu where two police people were attacked around 6 p.m. and killed. And their weapons taken. And within about seven months, we did a special operation at Kuntunasi. Is it Kuntunasi near Bekwai? And there was a gunfire. The robbers lost their life. And we retrieved that weapon. So that weapon traveled from where? Zualugu in the upper east region and found itself in Ashanti region. And retrieved weapons. One of them survived. The story of how they did it were told. And we are still working on a whole bunch of things in connection with that. So we don't want to do that. Then the issue of maybe some decommissioned weapons handling the hands of people. It's not beyond what we can control. But the beauty of it is that wherever it is, however it is, that would deal with it. Would deal with it decisively to make sure that you are safe. So that we want to assure you. The other issue is to do with Uncle. I think my uncle question was the second one, the second set. No, no, that, I'm trying to ident identify the individual, but in terms of the set of questions, I'll address them. The first one, Uncle, your questions weren't, they are solid questions. Let me put it that way. The first one to do with the golden age, the green age, and all that, and the word must. It's what is in the book, so it's quote unquote. And that is why I'm saying that it's what is in the book. So I'm just literally presenting what is in the book, but my mindset is different on that matter. And at least you've seen instances where I've stand up to certain things. I don't want to remind you. On the issue of the golden age and the money in the pocket of the police, how much of the gold is in the pocket of the police? We want to assure you that policing is a calling. And if I have the opportunity to reincarnate, I'll join the police again. And again. And again. Because I feel that it's one of the best jobs you can do when you look at people and you don't sleep and you get up in the morning and you have been able to keep the whole country safe and secure. It gives me so much satisfaction that no amount of money can buy. And like an analogy I gave you, selfish people in respect of how rich you are, you'll be forgotten. I want to be selfless so that even in the process of being forgotten, when I'm forgotten, I will intermittently be remembered. And I think that alone can probably give opportunity to my children, my children, children, because of what I stood for and what, together with my colleagues, we did. The issue of the, uh, the uniform, we have been struggling to change it. And we will get there, but I don't know how soon. But the unfortunate thing is that all the uniform we want to use have been taken by other security agencies. So the colors are almost done. So at times we do and recalibrate and we find now, then we come back. So we are working on it. But very soon we'll get to a point where we are doing because you see a police person in Lacoste, cutting Lacoste, blue, black, maybe navy blue or something, accommodating uh, tropical nature. We will get there. At first, we used to wear this traditional long car and all that. But now, IGP is in Beret. It means that you want to look smart and it's as young as you. So these are the issues. Then, about four hours, I will see you as soon as we do that. By my sister's question to do with the fact that response time. Response time, response time, response time. We will keep improving. But 
what is important is that we've seen that as a country, the best way of ensuring effective response is having police presence spread across the country in a very coordinated way. Like we came here, we said we are talking about things we are doing. We are not talking about things we are about to do. But one thing we are soon going to do by somewhere middle of next month is the deployment of almost 2,000 motorbikes across the country. And the whole country is network that our roads are going to be policed, the towns we see the motorbikes. And response time, we are looking at the average of less than 10 minutes. People will be there to deal with the matter for you. It will come. If I'm to show you, the map is not here. The way we have designed the networking across the country, deploying a few platoons of almost about 130 in major cities across the country, where all the exit routes to the country, to that city, is being, towns and cities are being white police, and the towns themselves are also being police. Like we said, we don't want to talk that much. We want our actions to do the talking for us. So give us a little patience. And when we get there, you'll see what it is. And you ask another question, which was the camera. No, the camera. You wrote it, but you don't have it. The camera. <laughs> the camera system we have is not centralized. We have a session in Kumasi. There's one going on in Tamale. The main one is in Accra. And it's networked in such a way that our communication is also effective, that whoever is observing, wherever is observing it from. Kumasi people, Ashanti region will be concentrated on Ashanti region. Accra will concentrate across the whole country, depending on areas that of threat to us in terms of crime analysis. And the GIS people will tell you, hotspot analysis and all that. And then, Tamale people also concentrated on the northern sector. So anytime there is the need for us to observe something and follow up, it is not an issue. It's just a communication to the next station, what action needs to be taken. And with the deployment of the FPUs, the regional FPUs in platoons across the country, is going to be phenomenal in terms of our response time and in dealing with all of these things. So I can assure you, there is a lot being done in that regard. Then the question of the number of police, that is the question from Dr. San, uh, Dr. Sapon, my, my big brother. He said that he went to Prempe College. Oh, Opokuwara. Ah, uh, okay. But you have a Prempe College color. <laughs> that is just by the way. But the most important thing is this. We have long recognized that deficiency. And we think that by a stretch of imagination, the university itself is a city on its own. So it's a city within a city, and it has to be police work. And like we said, we are not talking about things we are about to do, but it's a program in place to create university, police, patrol, and intelligence unit for all the universities. But we need to sort it out with you and the leadership of the university first, so that at any point in time, you see on mark sort of mobility and uniform also mobility, all aim at keeping all of you safe. And that is a partnership we are embarking on. And to be frank with you, this is going to be a permanent marriage between the police and the university community across the country, starting with KNUST. The, the forensic lab, lab, lab so by the young man, I can assure you, we came to build on the achievements of our forebearers. And nothing will stop us from doing that. Because this is it. When we succeed in doing that, then the resources spent on that will become beneficial to all of us. And I can assure you, within the shortest possible time, we are going to look into that matter and attend to it with the rapidity it deserves. I can assure you that. Thank you very much. I'm done. All right, so the moderator will also ask his question. Um, I realize on the digital and the satellite platforms that you are about to establish the Ghana Police Television. 
And I believe it is one of your efforts to improve the outlook of the police. Now, beyond the costs and the production of content, I have a concern on the plan. Is it to exclusively handle issues of police at the detriment of the other media houses? Is it going to be the go-to channel on everything police? Sad that it will probably not be evident on the other uh, platforms that we know. That's my question. The interesting point is that the issue of having the TV station, and at times people say that even other entities go national outlook, have TV stations, mention with the purpose of engaging. The issue is to create a channel to engage the communities to a level that we will win their hearts and minds and get them to partner with us to deliver the policing and keep this country safe and secure. That is the purpose for the establishment of that. And the beauty of it is that we will do it in tandem with all other media houses so that together we will come out as a group purposefully working together in partnership with each other and ensuring that we are able to engage. So it will be a cross-cutting thing and we will share and engage and interact and we'll be good to go. But the final bit on the issue of the cost is that all these are being funded by benevolence. And it is so beautiful that where we've got into, when we start coming out, you are attest to it that we came to complement and not to compete. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, the IGP, Dr. George Kufu Dampare. I will invite our chairperson, the vice chancellor, um, supported by the approvals, and then the dean to do a presentation to the IGP. So, um, my brother, our IJP, this is from us to you. And uh, we have Kwame Nkrumah standing there and giving us that freedom wave. This is the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And as you drove through, you went through the stool, which is a symbol of the Ashanti Kingdom. And therefore, we present this to you on behalf of management staff and the, our students and, of course, the entire university community. Um, we are very grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. So I think you can do it better for the IGP as he takes his seat. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that um, you would all agree with me that we have had a very insightful evening. Is that correct? And the presentation was clear, precise, concise. So you think I'm going to make an attempt to summarize? I wouldn't. Thank you. But it suffices to say that he is telling us that, look, we are all in this together. We are all in this together. 
He says the responsibility first and foremost is to ourselves, to our communities, and then to who? To them. To be able to help us, look after us, can continue to feel very secured. He work on our security mindset. Sometimes when I receive some of the reports from, you know, the, some of the challenges that students have had, security issues, and, and some of the stories, I, I, I just say, ah, my, my children, my students are intelligent than this. Go and bring all the laptops in your room because I'm a prophet so that I will pray for you so the impending death ahead of you will be taken and, you know, scrapped. And you go and bring your roommates three laptops. I beg your pardon. Please. Please. He said one thing. He said that above all, don't be part of the problem. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. IGP, we assure you that as a university, we will continue to collaborate with you, all the three areas that you stated, and even more, so that together we can achieve, not just for Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, but also for our dear country, Ghana, for the continent, and also for the And on that note, I just want to say thank you very much for making time to join us. We are so, so thankful and grateful to you and to all your team that came along with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson and Vice Chancellor. I'll go through my last batch of acknowledgements. I would want to acknowledge the Deputy Regional Commander of Ashanti Region Ghana Police Service, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Akwesi Ahi. <clears throat> Divisional Commander, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Mr. Abrokwa. <clears throat> Divisional Police Commander for Asokwa Division, Mr. Ohini Buedi Bosman. Assistant Commissioner of Police at the Police Hospital, he is a pathologist. Please applaud Dr. Ousu Efriye. I would want to acknowledge the media, Mr. Kwame Adinkra, for coming. We acknowledge all the staff and students who came. And finally, I will acknowledge myself. Let's take these two important announcements. Culture and Tourism, Year 2 students, you meet your teaching assistant immediately after this lecture in front of Block B. And then there will be a photography session in an orderly manner right here on the stage after the session. Shall we please rise for the closing prayer to be said by Reverend Father Dr. Anthony Na, the Catholic chaplain. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Dear Lord and Master, we are so much grateful to you for the gift of our lives. We thank you for our dear nation, Ghana. We thank you for the law enforcement agency. We thank you for the leader and the commander of the police service, our own IGP. We thank you for his words of encouragement to us and also his words of assurance that they are doing everything to make sure that we are within a safe environment. We thank you for the grace you've given them thus far, and we continue to entrust them into your care. If you don't build a house, the work of the builders are in vain. Be with them, with their families. Grant them the sound mind and body that they need in the execution of their work. We thank you for our dear university, we thank you for 70 years of existence of global impact and even our desire to do more. 
for our mother nation and for the entire world. We thank you for the leadership and management. We thank you for the idea college, the faculty, the committee that planned and organized this wonderful moment for us in our lives. We thank you for the fact that we all are involved in our own security. Be with us even as we depart from here. And may we all enjoy your protection, your love and care in our lives. And may your blessings be upon us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. I'd want to acknowledge the Ashanti Regional Police Commander. I hear he joined us later. Thank you very much for coming, sir. You are welcome. And uh, thank you all for coming. It's now time for the picture-taking session. Management, IGP, the Public Lecture Committee, and the Committee in Social Science who put together. You take it first. Afterwards, Nananum will take their part, and I'll be announcing as we go. So management, yes, we come on days um, and, and take the pictures here. All right, so, so students, use the back door. Photograph. Direct. Photograph. 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 Photograph.